Well, last Sunday, Virgilio brought the message. You might be praying before I get through that she might brought it to bring it today, too. I don't know. She did great. <laughs> anyway, uh, our promise is in 1 Peter chapter 4. And that chapter is such a neat chapter. Actually, there's both chapters, especially 4 and 5. And I just felt like when I was, realized that it was our chapter for today and the promise was there today, and the promise is the seventh verse, the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can, what? Pray. pray. Amen, isn't that what it says there? Yep. So that you can pray. How many know that you need to be clear-minded when you pray? Amen? What are some things that can get in the way when we're praying? How many know that sometimes we can be so overwhelmed with our needs that our prayers get to be all about us? Amen? And then there's sometimes, you know, when we have problems, maybe with our brothers and our sisters or our family, right? And you know that can get in the way, right? Amen? What, what, what am I saying this morning? Sometimes we have so many earthly things that we can't see the heavenly things. Amen? Right. You know, there, there's a lot of times that we pray out of desperation. Does God hear those prayers? <coughs> and then He does. But you know, I, I think sometimes the thing is, is notice that the end of all things is here. So to be clear-minded. What does it mean to be clear-minded? Well, Getting to be an old man as I am, sometimes I think when I remember something, I'm so clear-minded. <laughs> yeah. You're not alone. Not alone. <laughs> the trouble is, as you know, it's kind of like clear sky when you're praying for rain, right? Amen? <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, as, I, as I've been praying over this chapter, I, I have to say that I've... Anyhow, Lord help me with this chapter. Um, I, I read it, and then I go back and I look at so many places in the Bible that we find the Holy Spirit spoke through Paul. We can look at the fourth chapter here in 1 Peter, and we can go back to Paul's writings and it's just awesome how they bring the same message, the same word. And then there's times I, I read this and I think about some of these things. And anyway, uh, so I pray for me this morning because I, as I told Rand, I'm not too sure what all I'm going to use this morning. I <laughs> want God's will. Yes, Don? Well, let me talk here. Well, only because... Out of, out of our community, I was reading 1 Peter 4, or excuse me, I was reading 1 Peter 10, and it says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Amen. And that's our community. Amen. Right. Amen. So may that help you. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I've got that, I got that verse kind of, I got that verse kind of written down in there too. So, so, I need you to it. <laughs> um, Father, we just we just pray this morning as we open this portion of Scripture, Lord. And there's just so much in it there. There's so much, Lord, that Father, and yet, Lord, we want, Lord, your Holy Spirit this morning Amen. to speak to our hearts, Lord, as we look at this chapter. And Lord, as even as, Lord, I just kind of feel led to even go in and compare some of it with Paul's writing. And Lord, I just thank you for it. I thank you for the word. And Lord Jesus, we just place this in your hand this morning, that you might speak to each one of us. Maybe, Lord, in separate ways, Lord, as we read this. Maybe there's going to be individual ways in which we come to understand, come to see this chapter. And Father, we thank you for it. 
And we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I guess the, one of the things is the uh, first thing that I noticed, I don't know about your Bible, but my Bible calls it, this chapter, Living for God. My other Bible says, Walking in God's Will. How many know that living for God or walking in God's will are the same? Amen? Right? Living for God. So as we look at this, we're, that's one of the first things we're going, we're going to be looking at is living for Him, walking in His will. And notice this verse start, this chapter starts off with the word, therefore. <laughs> and you know, to really understand everything about therefore, we kind of need to go to the previous chapters. Because we find that actually what this chapter is doing is reinforcing or redoing what chapter 3 has already talked about. You know, and we find as we go back, we won't go back very far, but one of the things, I'll just go back just a little ways. Go back to verse 21 in 1 Peter 3. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So what do we see there? We find what uh, baptism symbolizes. It also tells us that Jesus is where? He's in heaven. Amen? And we find what he has done. And we find that he's at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers. And we also see that word submission to him. Amen? So there's a lot of things that we could kind of bring into this. And so when I look at that word, therefore... Notice, since Christ suffered in the body, what does your Bible say? Mine says, arm yourself also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with what? Sin. Sin. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? When you think about this part. You know, when we are living for God and we're walking in God's will, what about sin? Can I walk in God's will and still still be the old sinner that I always was? No. Yeah. Can I walk in God's will and saying, well, sin is too big, I can't conquer it. I can't conquer it in myself, right? But I can conquer it through Christ. And when you look at this, what's he saying? He says, when you conquer one, you overcome. Mm -hmm. Right? How many know that once that we give our life and heart to Christ, then we have to look at Christ. He suffered for us. Amen? Mm -hmm. He suffered for us. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us, the King James Version brings out it's for us that he suffered in the flesh, Jesus suffered death. Since Jesus suffered death, what's he saying? Arm yourself with the same purpose. And I'd like to turn, if you'd like to go to, to Ephesians, I'd like for us to look at Ephesians 6, 13, and 14. I think it's so neat. What's well, one of the things I guess I found myself doing this week a little bit as I was studying this chapter. I began to compare what Paul said and what Peter said. And you know, it's so amazing how they're really saying the same thing. In the 13th verse it says, Therefore take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil days, having done everything to, what? Stand firm. There it is. I see two things there. Number one, I need to learn to submit to God. Isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus said he didn't come to do his will, but the will of his Father. Amen? Amen? And you know, when we come to the place of accepting Christ as our Savior, our Lord and Savior, it's not that we have come to say, God, help me do my will, but we've come to submit to him. Amen? To submit to his will. That's number one. Unless I submit to God, can I really resist the devil? 
Nope. So those are two things. Number one, I need to submit to God. Number two, I need to resist the devil. There's two things that you might say really stand out if I'm walking in God's will. All right. The verse 14 in Ephesians says, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. What does it mean to gird your loins with truth? It means girding our loins with the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Isn't that right? Our strength is with the truth of God. Notice, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as I was thinking about that word, breastplate of righteousness, you know, so many times we have different ideas of it. I mean, a breastplate, we know what a soldier has, and we know what that purpose is for it. We also know that what righteousness means is we're to live righteously, I mean, as far as according to the Word of God and through what Christ has done within us. But you know, there was something else that just kind of popped out at me. The breastplate of righteousness is also right standing. It's right standing with God. But how many will agree with me it's also right standing with man? Right? It's right standing with God, and it's right standing with men. And what I would like to do is, if you want to turn with me to Romans chapter 6, we want to look at something that Paul brings out here, and I think it's, it's so neat. And Romans chapter 6 is a chapter that, if you've been baptized, you kind of know what that chapter has in within it. But I'd like to kind of read from the fifth verse, if I might, this morning, in Romans chapter 6. If you want to turn there, I know that Rand's put it up on the board here too. If we have been united with him, verse 5, like this in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. Whoa, how are we reunited with God in his death? You know, Jesus said, I didn't come to do my will, but the will of him who sent me, right? Isn't that what he was? He came united in Christ, in God. He came united with Him in His resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with Him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Isn't that basically what Peter is telling us here? Mm -hmm. Wow. How do we get victory over sin? It's told us to, to, to here too, just like it was in, in, in Peter. That we no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Pretty neat verse. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once and for all. But the life He lives... He lives to God. That's the pages. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ Jesus. Amen. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you're not under law, but you're under grace. How many can say, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we, we look at that portion of Scripture there, and sometimes we see that word sanctification. What sanctification, what does it mean? Well, I jotted down just a couple of things this week. Number one, it means separation from sin. How many of this morning a lot of times we say, I'm thankful I'm sanctified? <laughs> Some of us might say we're still going through the sanctification process, right? Amen. <laughs> but, <laughs> I didn't hear very many amens on that, but that's okay, right? <laughs> The second part, we find sanctification means separation from sin, but it's also separation to God. 
going back to the heading of this chapter in Peter, is living or for Him, walking in His will. And so we find if we're going to be walking in His will, we have to do something about that old nature. Amen? We have to do something about that part. And then I'd like to turn with me back to, to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'd like to go to the second verse here. And I think it's so neat, and yet it's so important. Notice what it says. We look at verse 2. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but, for, but rather for the will of God. Our lives have changed. We're not living like we used to live. Now we're living the will of God. You know, I don't know about you, but I, had, I was looking at one of my old Bibles, and I had written, in that verse, dedicated to do God's will. Have you come to that place of you've dedicated your life to do His will? Because what He has done for us, we have responsibility to do for Him. Amen? Right? Now I'd like for it, if you will, with me, <clears throat> you can turn to Colossians 3. We'll look at some more of Paul's writings here. I think it's so neat. Um, you know, when we come to Christ, and when we submit to God, and when we dedicate our life to Him, number one, we need to seek what? Eternal things. Not earthly things, but eternal things. How many know that we need to be looking up? Amen? Amen? Paul turns, you might say, from the doctrinal to a personal and practical way. As you look at Colossians 3, verse 1, If you then have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What can we say there? Spiritually live with an upward look. Amen? We start looking up to Him. Is that, is that not what Jesus did? Did Jesus sometimes spend nights looking up to God? And you know, how He experienced God in a way that He was willing to take up the cross. Amen? Not only take up the cross, but forgive those who crucified him. And you think about, well, that would have been hard. That would have been awful. And you know, for Jesus and who he was, he could have done one of two things. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have destroyed the earth right then <clears throat> and said, we're going to start all over again. Did you hear what Eve told her two boys? I mean, what Adam told her two boys, told their two boys one day? Mama ate us out of house and home. <laughs> well, she did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are to be centered on Christ, God's interest. In verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Earthly things, things of the flesh. Romans 8.8 8 says, cannot please God, right? The things of the flesh cannot please God. Let's go down to verse 3 in 1 Peter chapter 4. And notice, we look at that verse this morning. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. Living in debauchery, 
lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. You know, as I was kind of thinking about that part of the verse, you know, I was kind of trying to think about, how does it really happen? You know, we, we all have testimonies of what our life was, right? And how things have faded away, or become less important, or how things have changed in our life. And you know, some of us can look back at some things and say, for me, they have died in my life. They've died. How many know that um, sometimes it took a while for it to happen? Some of us remember the struggle that we went through. Some of us may still be struggling through some things. Amen? And you know, it, it's kind of amazing what it is that sometimes will come up. <laughs> You know, sometimes we say, well, it just kind of faded away. This is where my interest was. This is what I thought. But it's faded away. How many know it fades away only through purpose? Right? You know, yes, there's sometimes when we've come and we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed and there's times that, Lord, I just cast it at the foot of the cross. And when the devil comes in, sometimes we tell him, look, it's not here anymore. <laughs> you know, it's so important that we do that. And you know, <clears throat> part of it is, and I don't know exactly how we can kind of share how this is, but, you know, sometimes we have to say that we're hidden with Christ. Being able to be hidden with Him. And you know, I don't know exactly, but I think fades away or through purpose, salvation brings a changed life. And you know, we have to say this. If we have really died with Christ, guess what? There's a resurrection day coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Some of us have died with Christ right here in this room. Some of us remember the day we got up and we were free. Amen? The time of resurrection. You know, and sometimes that resurrection is reserved for the future. It's precious. But sometimes it's still future. You know, verse 4 as we go to Colossians, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. You know, calling us to a heavenly kingdom. You know, this morning, I guess we have to say it together, our calling is to a heavenly kingdom. <coughs> it's not how big of an earthly kingdom we can build, but what are we build is for a heavenly kingdom. Amen. And you know, there's lots of times we have to pray, Lord, what is it that's really a heavenly kingdom? In Mark 4, verse 35, it says, For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Uh, do you want to put up Ephesians 6, 6 for me? For me? Ephesians 6. Or somebody have it? Ephesians 6, 6, 6. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Okay, like slaves doing it from our heart. Amen? Wow. You see, whatever one does, the will of God, he's got to do it from where? It's from our heart. Mm -hmm. 
It's from our heart. Hebrews 10.36. Does it have that one? Somebody got it? Want to bring it up? Hebrews 10.36. And somebody else look up 1 John 2.17. Hebrews 10.36. It's a neat one. Okay. Cast not... Yeah, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense and reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you what? Might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. You know, we could spend quite a bit of time on those three verses, couldn't we? The verses I think that we need to really get down in our heart when you think about that part. 1 John 2.17. Does somebody want to look that one? Share that one? I think it's and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Okay, this chapter is living for God, isn't it? It's doing the will of God. That's what this chapter here is about. You know, promise to those who do the will of God. How many know there's a connection between doing and keeping the word of God in your faith? How many know that there is connection between doing the word and keeping the word? Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. And then let's go to verse 4. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. You know, as we look at this here fourth verse, we have to be dedicated to God's will. And you know, when we are really dedicated to God's will, how many know there's a surprising change? Right? People see the difference in our lives. Going on to verse 5, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and dead. <coughs> who will have to give account? They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them in the same blood disposition. They heap abuse on you. But they'll have to give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. Well, there, there's, there's some verses we could look at there too, but I think we'll, we'll push on here this morning just a little bit. Yeah, our time is going kind of fast here. But there are several. They give account for him. Let's go to verse 6 as we look at this part. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. I kind of read different things under this verse, but I guess one of the things that kind of came up that I was reading is, you know, that he was saying there's a, there's a people that have died believing what he's already bringing. And, you know, they're dead, but they might be judged according to, the, to men regarding the body. The body of what? The body of Christ. Amen? So we find uh, Paul in another place telling us that, you know, the, the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised, right? So it kind of is going back to that part, and I think it's kind of neat to do that. Okay, in verse 7, we read that this morning. That's what's on our, our, our promise today. But I guess there's a verse that I would like for us to kind of connect with that. The end of all things is at hand, therefore... Be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. In James 5, 8, you too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So what's he saying? Strengthen your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. What did we just find out? We found out that our life and relationship with Christ is a relationship of the heart. Amen? It's from the heart. It's not from the mind. But it's from the heart. And this is what he is saying. As we look at that, it's from the heart. 
And then I was looking at, on the, in my Bible, it says, we should view our lives in the light of Christ's imminent coming and the end of the world. And it gives us some verses and so on that we can look up. To Peter, this calls for the following commitments. To pray to God fervently and daily, number one. Number two, to love one another deeply from the heart. Number three, to be hospitable and kind to those in need. Verse nine. Four, to serve other believers through the use of spiritual gifts given by the Spirit. Five, to witness for Christ and serve God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then seven, we find to remain loyal to Christ in trials. And you know, as, as we go through that, it kind of just brings that part out so much. And as we go to the number two part, it's kind of where I've got my deal, I go to verse eight. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Let nothing hinder relationship with God and man. And Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but lover, love covers all transgressions. Isn't that something? And then as Donna was sharing, that you know, those that minister in verse 7, it talks about ministering in prayer. Verse 8, it talks about ministering in love. And then we find there's also ministering through selfless service as we look at those next three or four verses. Verses 9 and 10 goes on, and that kind of, kind of covers that part. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, <coughs> administrating God's gift, God's grace, in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do as one speaks <coughs> the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides. So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. I had also kind of jumped on down to 1 Peter 5, chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. And I'd just like to kind of close with just a couple of thoughts from there. That verse 6 says, Humble yourself. When you look at the second chapter and you're looking at the sixth verse. And we find it saying, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. You can never defeat the devil with pride. The very essence of the devil is pride. Right? And we could look up several verses here, too, this morning. But I'll tell you, one of the verses that's kind of neat is Matthew, if you want to jot it down, it's Matthew 6, 25 through 34. This is really a, another one. And then as you go on down, um, be self-controlled, verse 8. Alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Does he, does he try to eat Christians? He's telling us to be aware of where you are. <laughs> be sober of the spirit, because the devil's seeking someone to devour. You know, a couple of things I wrote down under my verse there is don't let the devil steal your time. Number one, be alert. Number two, watch every thought and attitude. Amen. Sometimes we need to pray, Lord, forgive me for that thought. Forgive me for my attitude. Help me, Lord. And you know, many times we have to do those kind of things. And in verse 9, we look at that one. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast. Mm -hmm. To Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. How many are standing for those verses to be Amen. with you? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. Um, I like, 
I'd like to read another one more verse. It's found in James. If you'd like to turn with me to James chapter 4. It's so neat what he brings out. I'd like to just begin with the seventh verse there. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. Um, didn't Peter just tell us to do that? Yes. Okay. And he will flee from you. So if he don't flee from me, there might be a little problem with my submission. Come near to God and he will come near to you. And I love that verse. Amen. Because when I come near to God, it says he'll come near to me. So how many have found that so, many, so much of the time God's waiting for us to come near? He's just waiting for us. Oh Lord, I just want to be close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. How do we wash our hands? We wash it through repentance, right? We wash our hands through repentance. Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. And you know what? Does he cleanse me? He says he'll never be remembered anymore. You know, I was just kind of looking at my hands the other day. You know, I've washed them quite a bit. But I can still see yesterday in them. Right? The day before in them. <laughs> it says, notice... Um, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will do what? He will lift you up. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? And He will lift you up. Praise God. How many run into days when you said, God, I just need you? Anybody been there? Sometimes, sometimes it seems like every day I'm coming. Lord, I need you. I just need you. I just need to sit on your lap. I just need to experience your touch. Lord, I want to ride in your truck. I want to ride with you. You know, how many know that when we come that way with Him, that He'll let us ride with Him? He'll let us experience Him? And how often sometimes we just need to do that. <laughs> Praise His name. Shall we stand together this morning? And thank you for letting me kind of, I guess, poke around in detail in that chapter, but there's so much in there. And I guess one of the things that really kind of spoke to me, I got a whole bunch more verses that joined with that with that chapter or <laughs> two. But I guess what really ministered to me was um, I guess it was Friday night or Thursday night, I can't remember that I went out to my to the trailer and and Lord I don't know what to bring. I don't know what to do. And you know as I was reading, reading, and as I was going into it, I just found so many scriptures, you know, just going through the Word of God. And I just felt like, the Lord help me. But I hope that this morning that God's given you something, okay? <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you for your Word. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that we don't have to understand it by ourselves. We don't have to understand it. But Lord Jesus, your Holy Spirit reveals your word to us. And your word, your Holy Spirit reveals it to our heart. It reveals your word to the places in our heart, Lord, and in our life that, Father, we just need healing. We need to be set free. Lord, we need that confidence. And Lord, there's still areas in this old flesh that still want to rise up and be counted. And Lord, I thank you that, Father, we would overcome. And Lord, we overcome through your word. We overcome, Lord Jesus, when we make that decision. Lord, I want to be all yours. And Lord, you give us that opportunity. Lord, I thank you. And Father, I guess as 
Lord, we just pray that we as the body of Christ here in Hillside, Lord Jesus, will just be all yours. And Lord, I want to thank you for the body here. I want to thank you for their love. I want to thank you for their willingness, Lord Jesus, to be or to do whatever you have for us to do. And yet, Lord, most of all, I just feel like help us to know how to reach our community for you. Oh, God, I pray. Lord, we know it's not humanly possible, but yet, Lord, it is heavenly possible. And Lord, I know that you love everyone here. And Lord, we just lift up our community to you. We lift up our country to you. And Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we just, as we close our service today, and Lord, we just thank you for your love. Thank you for being with us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If there's anybody that wants a prayer this morning or anything, we're here. Okay? Amen. Hallelujah.